There's really a lot of concepts here. So again, maybe it'll help to have a handout that covers this. Okay, so we've been talking about here on the handout for electromagnetic induction, how any of these changing things can change the magnetic flux, and then by Faraday's law, that can cause an induced voltage. There's a negative sign in this equation, but in your course, you're not really going to use that negative sign much. As, is, as we generally do, we're, us we're usually just going to use the formulas to find the magnitudes. All right, um, and then what would be another name for the induced voltage? Another name for a voltage source is an EMF. That's another name that you and I haven't talked about, and you've probably seen in the homework. So this could also be called the induced EMF. Um, that's not a force, it's a voltage. All right, um, and we know that voltage sources can cause currents. Well, what would be an equation that we could use to find the current once we know the voltage source? Um, yeah, that's our key equation that relates voltage and current. So at this point, you can use Ohm's law, and you can see that's in the handout as well. The way to go from here to here is Ohm's law. Uh, and then we know that currents create magnetic fields. How can we figure out the direction of the magnetic field and the direction of the current, and even say the direction of the electromagnetic force, uh, I mean the uh, electromotive force? Uh, for that, we use Lenz's law, which you might have heard mentioned in class. The basic idea here is that the induced magnetic field tries to oppose the change in the magnetic flux. The magnetic field that we're inducing is going to try to oppose this change over here, and we can use that to figure out what the directions are going to be. Okay, so what would be our general procedure for solving um, these types of um, problems? So I tried to set that out um, at the, uh, underneath the, uh, the big table with the flowchart. Basically, we're going to have to use this equation. So you can see that we have to find the derivative of the flux. But before we can do that, we need to get an expression for the flux. So this is what I tried to set out here. First, we have to get an expression for the magnetic flux. Uh, and then we can take uh, the derivative of this magnetic flux. The key thing is we're not trying to get a number for the magnetic flux because you can't take the derivative of a number. Instead, you have to get an algebraic expression because that's the only kind of thing that we can take a derivative of. And when we take the derivative of the flux, that will either involve the derivative of B or it will involve the derivative of A, or it will involve the derivative of theta. <coughs> so we have to figure out which of those derivatives we're going to need. And I tried to give some hints about how to find all those derivatives in that little section uh, underneath the flowchart. Okay, well, um, let's try to do this pr precise example to see how the method works. All right, so like it says uh, underneath the flowchart, the first thing we need to do is get an expression for the magnetic flux. So here's our general formula. However, in this case, we were told that we have a uniform magnetic field. What do we get if we integrate all the little da's? Um, just a? Yeah. If we um, integrate all the small areas, that just gives us the total area. So here's going to be our basic formula. We want to take the component of the magnetic field that's perpendicular to the surface and multiply it uh, times the area. But what can we say about the component of the magnetic field that's perpendicular to the surface in this case? Uh, what's the relationship between the overall magnetic field and the component that's perpendicular to the surface? Um, good, that's right, they're equal. The entire magnetic field is already perpendicular to the surface. So we can just say this is the same as the perpendicular component that we want. So we can just use B. That already has the component that's perpendicular. All right, um, so here's our expression. So we've done the first step and we've gotten an expression for the flux. Now the next thing we have to do is try to take the derivative of the flux. Well, how can we simplify this derivative? Which of these do we know is going to be a constant? 
Yeah. Well, if this is a constant, how does this expression simplify? What would be a simple simplification that we can make? Um, well. If we know that this is a constant, what's a way, way that we can just rewrite this expression that's a little bit simpler? Can we just pull the a out? Yeah, so that's right. You can take constants out of derivatives. Okay. Um, so now we have the derivative of the flux like this. Well, now that we've taken the derivative, we have to actually plug in some numbers. So what can we plug in for a in this case? Um, yeah, 4 times 2, or 8 square meters. Of course, everything here has to be in SI units. But to make things simple, I already put things in SI units. All right, now we get to the tricky part. We have to put in something for the derivative of b. Um, and there's really three different cases that I tried to go through there at the bottom of the uh, flow chart. So sometimes they just tell you the derivative of b, so then you can just use it. Sometimes they give you an expression for b, and then you have to find the derivative. And sometimes they give you the change in b and how much time has elapsed, and you can use that to find the derivative. Um, well, what would apply here, what, uh, they actually gave us enough information here to know what this derivative is. So where did they tell us? Well, we need to find this derivative. The change in B. Yeah, so what should I plug in for the derivative of B with respect to T? Uh, 3 tenths lift per second. That's right. This was the simplest case where they actually told us the derivative. This is the simplest case where they actually told us derivatives. So I'll just plug that in. By the way, this is a case where I think it's really helpful to know the units. What are the units for B? Um, the units. What are the units for a magnetic field? You can check one of your flow charts if you need to for that. Yeah, and what are the units for time? Second. So if you are trying to check whether you've been told what the derivative of b with respect to t is, you should check the information you were given for something in teslas per second. So that would be a big clue that this is the derivative that we need, because it's in the right unit, units of tesla per second. So that's one reason why it's a really good idea to memorize the units for b, so you can find its derivative. OK, well, now we know um, this derivative, and we're ready to go on uh, to the next step. Now, think about what you were trying to do when you first tried to do this problem. You did what most students do, which actually turned, uh, which turns out to be a mistake. Your first instinct was to try to calculate B. You said, gee, magnetic flux involves the magnetic field, so it seems logical that you need a number for B. But we don't need a number for B here. We only need a number for the derivative of B. And that really messes people up. They never get past the first step because they spend all their time trying to figure out what the level of B is. Even if we were told the level of B here, it would be completely irrelevant. Because the induction doesn't come from B, it comes from the change in B. That's why I said underneath the flowchart that we're, um, at this step, we weren't trying to get a number for the flux. We were just trying to get an expression for the flux. If you had plugged in a number for B, it would be impossible to take its derivative. So we shouldn't try to get an, a number for the thing that's changing. We should just try to get an expression so that then we can take the derivative later on. So that's a common mistake that people make. All right, um, well, now we've figured out um, this derivative, and now we're ready to figure out the induced voltage. Um, but Faraday's law makes it very easy to figure out the induced voltage. If the derivative here is 24, what's the induced voltage going to be? Based on Faraday's law. Yeah, and we're going to ignore this negative sign here again. That, that's a little bit advanced for an introductory course. We'll just try to figure out the magnitude of the induced voltage. Well, the magnitude of the induced voltage here will just be 24. What would be the units on the induced voltage when you're ready? Um, volts. Right, because it's a voltage. By the way, um, this isn't too important, but we can figure out from this formula that the units for the flux have to be volts times seconds. Oh, you know, that's not what I wanted to do. Yeah, um, that's true, but we, we, we don't need that here. Okay, well, the units for this derivative must be volts. If this is in volts, this must be in volts, but maybe that's more confusing than it's worth. So the key thing here is if we just focus on magnitudes, Faraday's law is very simple. The induced voltage is just the same as the derivative of the flux. So this is the key step right here. All right, now we found the induced voltage. Uh, now we have to try to find the induced current. Well, if this is the induced voltage, uh, what equation can we use to find the induced current? Ohm's Right. So let's work that out. What would we get then?
Okay, so that would be 4.8. Am I doing that right? Um, All right. I don't think so. No? Okay. <laughs> You are right. I did not do that right. Let's try again. So yeah, this should be times the current. So this should be, so I saw about 4.8 amps. Does that seem right? 24 divided by 5. Yeah, that is 4.8. Okay. I'm trying to go too fast here. So we get that the current is 4.8 amps. 